Hello, everybody. It's Pastor Tom welcoming you to another study of the Word. Glorious day. Enjoying myself here in my office, spending a little bit of time with the Lord and actually spending time with you, too, in the book of Romans, which we're going through verse by verse. This will be our 22nd session, half an hour session, on Romans, and we're not nearly done with it. We did get to Romans chapter 8, and so I want you to turn over there. Reminding you to go to our website, faithalifefellowship.org. There's free seminars there. You can uh, you can uh, easily give an offering if you'd like to, which we, we always mention that because we are trying to uh, expand our our partners. The more partners we get, the more we can win souls, we can do crusades, and that's really our heart is to be soul winners and then teach. So those two things are very important. We're establishing new works. We're doing a lot of things, but those two things, within the context of everything we do, pretty much, it's it's either it's go, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and then it's also to make disciples. Those two things are paramount in our focus of our life. And so uh, these uh, this uh, particular um, uh, YouTube page basically is a, is a Bible school. It's a free Bible school. And so verse by verse commentary is only one thing we do. We do lots of uh, other teaching on different subjects. We just go to the playlist and you can look them over. There's many many hundreds of videos now. I don't know how many we have. And we also have um, another uh, church uh, uh, YouTube video. It's a uh, uh, F A F video one, and uh, if you go to faithalifefellowship.org, you can hop over to that one too. And on that, we have more of the church, um, a lot of a lot of film stuff from, and even television things and things like that. So, anyway, we go to Romans chapter eight. We were there, and we're going to start again in Romans chapter eight, and we're going to start in verse twenty six, where we come to one of my Favorite passages of scripture in the entire Bible, and uh, there's just a lot in this, and so uh, hopefully we can get through this pretty good today. Romans chapter 8, verse 26, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Okay, this is an important word. I want you to make some notes. When you see the word helpeth here, uh, what it's, uh, it's talking about is the word actually means um it's kind of like if you have a piano, I'll illustrate it. You have a big piano, and it's really heavy. And so if you try to move that piano yourself, you're not going to be able to do it. But if you get some help, two or three or four guys, then it becomes you know, manageable to do that. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit comes to our aid, gives us supernatural ability and strength. It's not just us. It's not just him. It's both, both of us working together, not one outside the other. The Holy Spirit just doesn't run around doing everything. We have to do something, and then he'll help us, okay? And he'll help us in different ways. But here he's talking about taking hold together against with us, is what it says in the Greek. Taking hold together against with us, all right? Our infirmities. So the Holy Spirit takes hold together with us against our infirmities. That's the Greek. The Holy Spirit takes hold together with us against our infirmities. The word infirmities here has lots of meanings. It can mean weakness. We all have weaknesses, don't we? Uh, it could mean sickness. It could mean a lot of things. Weakness of mind. But the Holy Spirit will help us. He'll take hold together against our weaknesses, our infirmities, our sicknesses. For we, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Now, we do know what to pray for, and sometimes we do know how to pray. The Word of God teaches us that. Okay? There's different forms of prayer. There's different kinds of prayer. There's different ways we pray. pray. And, the whole, and, and the Bible points out a lot of that. But sometimes... We don't know exactly how to pray. As an example, you may be praying for somebody that has a sickness, or you may be praying for something that you have. Let's just say somebody else does. But you may know they have a sickness, and you may know that we need to pray against that. We know that Jesus bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases. But you don't know exactly how to pray for that because you might just say, well, look, 
Lord heal them. But really what needs to be prayed is there needs to be prayed. I'm just giving you an example. For an understanding uh, uh, of something to come to that individual that's caught the root cause of that sickness. Maybe they need to know about some unforgiveness or bitterness or resentment in their life, quite possibly. Uh, it could be they need to change their diet. They need to lose some weight. They need to exercise more. I mean, it could be a thousand different things. We don't know. But this is one of the great things about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he takes hold together with us against our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray for us, we should. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Isn't that wonderful? Now, this is not as easy for some people. Some people can say, well, groanings, what does that mean? Well, the word groanings here, believe me, I've spent many years studying this. And one of the best translations of this that you can find is the, gro the word groanings means um, when it says, likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. We know not what we should pray for as we're up, but the Spirit himself makes intercession or stands in the gap for us with groanings which cannot be uttered in articulate speech. Groanings which cannot be uttered in our known language. Now here's the best translation I've ever heard. Uh, let, me, let me back up. Uh, he says, the, for we know not what we should pray for as we are, but the Spirit himself. Well, who is the Spirit? God. God himself makes intercession for us with groanings or utterances which we don't understand. or with God talk. <laughs> Let's read it like that. That's interesting. I know you, that went over your head for a second. We'll, we'll get it. Go back again. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with God talk. Now, that is heavy duty. That come, that Number one, God talk. What is that? The Spirit of God can talk to God because he is God. He knows what we need. Sometimes it's a sigh. <sighs> that could be a prayer. God knows what you, you know, on the inside, that sighing, all right, can be a prayer. It can be an intercession because the Spirit of God is talking or maybe a bit of a groan, oh, or it's a deeper groan or it's a travail groan, which I can't do and I can't make that up. Or maybe it's other tongues as the Spirit of God gives us the utterance. This is one of the main reasons I'm a big advocate of being baptized with the Holy Ghost and speaking with tongues, because that's what he's talking about here. There's some things the Holy Spirit can't do unless we yield to praying in other tongues, because this is the way he's chosen to do it. The body of Christ should be equipped, all of us, at, at the new birth when we get saved. The first thing that should happen after our salvation is we should be baptized in the Holy Ghost we should speak with other tongues and, and have, get our prayer language. That's the main reason he gives us that. There's other things about it, too. I'm not going to get, get into that right now. But the ability to pray. And we can pray supernaturally. Sometimes you look at a situation. I don't know how to pray about this. My God, this is overwhelming. You know, I mean, it could be a thousand different things. How do I know I'm supposed to move? How do I know I'm supposed to take this job or that job? How do I know who I'm supposed to marry? Well, those are all weaknesses. We may be mixed up about it. We may not understand. But if you pray long enough in other tongues, the Spirit of God will take hold together with you against that weakness and make it clear. Strengthen that weakness. Give me the answer. Give you the wisdom. Because God always, write it down, God always gets his own prayers answered. In other words, he is enabling us. He is praying through us the perfect will of God. I don't know how much clearer it can get than that. He is praying through us by his spirit. He is praying for us by his spirit through us. We are just channels of his blessing. We are just people that are, are filled with the spirit that are, are allowing him 
to give to, to flow into this earth because before God can do anything in the earth, my dear brother and sister, we have to ask him. You ever thought about that? Why does God have prayer? Why did he, why didn't, if God's just God and he's going to do whatever he's going to do, then why does he say things like, you have not because you ask not? Yes, you don't have it because you ask amiss. He says, what things whatever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you'll have them. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. You know, but you got to ask. And people go, well, Pastor Tom, if he's God, why do we have to ask? He knows what we need even before we ask him, the Bible says. Yeah, but you still have to ask why. That's the way he has decided and chosen to make it work. It's a covenant thing. We are in covenant with him, but we have to ask. In other words, he's going to pray through us. And there's and, and people out here in the world that we're praying for, even your brother and sister, even yourself, you don't know everything, but he does. When you're praying for your Uncle Benny or Joe or whoever, you don't know how to pray for a lot of times what they need. What do they really need? You may perceive they need this, but maybe they don't really need that. Maybe they need this, you see. Because God goes to the root of the problem. I think if every Christian were praying in the Spirit, like he's talking about here, on a consistent basis across this world, there would be so much revival and so much power of God being poured out that it, it really, it would blow you away. In fact, I'm sure about that. Because really, relatively, in amongst the spirit field community, which there's billions of us now, but even among that community, probably one, one to two percent of us really do much in this. And that's unfortunate because here we have the ability to allow God to pray the perfect will of God through us, and we're not taking care of that. So I, I just encourage all of my listeners today, if you have not been baptized in the Holy Ghost and spoke with tongues, just go into my section on uh, the Holy Spirit, the playlist, and find the ones I did on baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, listen to them, and I'll pray with you right on there, and you'll receive. Uh, many, many, many people have received uh, just by watching those videos. Uh, if you go to our website, faithalifefellowship.org, uh, there is a, um, a whole free seminar called The Missing Link, which is talking about this. And you can just watch that. Praise God. Once we begin to pray like we're supposed to, God enabling us to pray. This is what's different between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they could not... That was not an, uh, an issue with them. I, they, they didn't have the Spirit of God on the inside of them. In the New Testament, man, we got that, that living water flowing out of us, and that changes things out here if we'll just do it. So, praise God. So he says, with groanings which cannot be uttered, in articulate speech, known speech, God talk, and he that searches, verse 27, the hearts, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to God, or the will of God. How can we not understand how important that is? He that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Of course he does. Because he makes intercession for the saints according, it says the will of God, that's written in, but according to God. So when you, when you got intercession according to God, you're going to get your prayers answers every time. This is one of the most powerful, awesome, beautiful, wonderful, interesting scriptures, when we act on it, it becomes one of the greatest things that's happening in our life. I've taught on these things for, for 42 years, 42 years, studied this, I still can't beat it. I can't find anything that beats it. I mean, that's, this is just powerful. So in context here, verse 26, let's read it again. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered in articulate speech or God talk. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to God. And he's not done with this point yet. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God and that are called according to his purpose. Now, here's an interesting thought. Because people take these verses of Scripture, especially verse 28, they pull it out of context, and they say, well, the Bible says that all things are working together 
for the good of them that love God. And they quote that, but they say, you're dying of cancer, that's working out for your good. They say your child died or got killed in a car accident, that's for your own good, or whatever it is. They really believe everything that happens is God. God's in control of everything. So everything that happens in our lives is really working out some divine uh, good. That's not what he's talking about at all in context here. He says we know that all the things that we, he's just talking about this God talk, all these things are working together for the good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. As the people of God start yielding to the Spirit of God, start praying in the Spirit, traveling in the Spirit, praying in tongues, speaking in tongues, making intercession for the saints according to God, we know all things are working together. All that is working together. We know every kind of prayer like that is working together for the good of them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So that's what's being said there. That needs to be taught that way, because if, it does, if it's taken out of context, you get a warped idea about God. Hallelujah. But it is true that if we all pray that way, the will of God can be poured out in the earth because we're asking him to do so. Hallelujah. But I don't know if that was worth for you, uh, worth you tuning in. I'm, I guarantee you, if you just think about it, go back and listen to it again if you didn't get it. Listen to it 15 times if you need to. Verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to his image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, we have uh, uh, different doctrines that run through the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Predestination is one. Predestination is people believe that because uh, God just, you know, he calls certain people, they're, they're going to be saved. So we don't have, the, the ones that are going to be saved are going to be saved. And that's, you know, uh, we don't have to uh, worry about it. Because they're going to be saved, they're going to be saved. And so people don't preach the gospel. And they, they, you know, they just say, well, if it's God's will, they're going to be saved. That's just ridiculous. There's so many uh, scriptures that refute that. But we are predestined. In other words, God did call us even before he, uh, our mother's wombs, while we were, you know, before he even created the heavens and the earth. We had a destiny. And he predestined us for this destiny. He foreknew us. And so the ones he did that to, that's you and me, if we've been born again, he knew who's going to get saved, yes. But, you know, it's through the preaching of the gospel. We have a free will. So as we preach the gospel, we accept that, we come into the family of God, then what happens is we're predestined to be conformed to his image. That's what he really wants. He wants us all to be conformed to his image, um, the image of his son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. So it's very important for you to understand that you have a destiny, that you, be, you have been predestined by God for specific work in this earth. And it's up to you to find that out, what that is. Um, but all his family has be, been predestined, yes. He knows who's going to get saved. He knows who's not going to get saved. We know. Our job is not to know who's going to get saved, who's not going to get saved. Our job is the preaching of the gospel, to make as many disciples as possible, to plant the seeds. That's our job. God's job is to draw them in and to uh, uh, bring them into the kingdom. He knows which ones will. He knows which ones won't, but those of us who have been brought into the kingdom need to understand that we are predestined for greatness, to be conformed to his image. We are predestined uh, for uh, uh, divine purposes. Praise God. We need to find out what that is. Now, verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. So in other words, he knew who was going to get saved. He called us, all right, by the preaching of the gospel. And whom he called, then he justified. We got washed in the blood. We became justified just as if we'd never sinned. And whom he justified, he also glorified. We are now glorified creatures. Hallelujah. We have been filled with the Holy Spirit. We have, uh, you know, the gifts of the Spirit. We have the character of Jesus Christ. We got all these wonderful things going for us. So what shall we say to these things? Verse 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? Good question. Really, nobody. If God has predestinated us, we know him. He has a destiny for our lives. We're in this earth a short time. We are his children. We are his church. Praise God. We're his separated, called ones. 
We are sons and daughters of God. If God be for us, really, who can be against us? In other words, if God's for us, who can be against God? Because if, if somebody comes against us, they're really coming against God. It's his family. So, it really, <laughs> if God be for us, who can be against us? He asks a question. The truth of the matter is nothing, really. The devil can't do it. The devil can't. I mean, nothing. Now he goes on and he, and he, and he gives him some light on that. 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Wow. He that spared not his own son. I mean, that he can't go any further than that. He cut a covenant with his own son. Delivered him up for us all into heaven so that we can, praise God, go to heaven. How shall he not freely give us all things? People talk about, well, I don't believe God wants us to prosper. I don't believe he wants us to have money or material things. Well, you don't understand God much. God has paid the price for us to be taken care of here on earth very well. Hallelujah. I mean, freely we have been given all these things. Verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. In other words, people can say all they want against the church. They can curse us. They can blaspheme us. They can call us crazy, idiots, extreme, weirdos, right-wing wackos, homophobes, zebophobes, this is a phobe, that is a, whatever. But who can really do anything about it? It's God that justifies. In other words, if God said, that's my people, I've washed them in my blood, nobody can say anything, the devil can't say anything, no person can say anything, that's the way it is, man. You cannot make a charge against God's elect. Because it's God himself that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? Wow, Jesus is at the right hand of God making intercession for us. How does he make intercession for us? Well, he makes intercession for us, praise God, by him just standing there with his blood. But also the Spirit of God, again, is in on the inside of us making intercession through us as his body. It's really interesting to me that it says here uh, that Christ is the only one that can condemn. In other words, God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, they're the ones that are going to do the, the judgment, you know. And so if, if God has called us, justified us, made us holy, Nobody can say anything against it because when it all wraps down, it's God that's going to judge every human being, okay? He judges the church, praise God, by our um, what we do and, and, and rewards and so on. But he also is going to judge the world. And there's not going to be one person that is judged by God in the world that's going to stand up, point their finger at God, and say, I was just as good as they were. You, you, this guy over here, my neighbor, he was... Uh, uh, he did this, this, and this, and this. He's not really a real good Christian. But, but, but if he's been washed in the blood of Jesus, none of that means anything. What really means something is God justified him. And if God justified through, if they're justified through Jesus Christ, it's, it's not about, people say, I'm a good person. I deserve to go to heaven because I, 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 was, I was a good person. I never committed adultery. I kept the Ten Commandments. No, that's not the way we get to heaven. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's not about a act of sin. It's a, it's a, it's about whose family we're in. We're all sinners when we're we're born into the into into this world. You know, I mean that sin it, it got us all, and so the only thing that makes any difference to God is whose family we're in. We're either born of God in His family, justified, or we're not. And you say, well, that's the push. That's narrow. Well, narrow is the way that leads to life. You can't sit there and tell me that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again because he says, okay, I did that for you, but, you know, other ways to get to heaven too. You know, Muhammad did it. You know, Buddha did his thing. Everybody did his thing, and we can all come. No, 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 no. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Either you're going to believe that or not. But when you stand before God, that's what he believes. And so... It, that, that's the only grounds we have to stand on here. See? So, hallelujah. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Good question. 
Shall tribulation, real extreme testing and trials and pressure, is what that word means in the Greek. Uh, no. That won't separate, separate us from the love of God. How about distress? Ever been under any distress? <clears throat> Not going to do it. How about persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Excuse me, I got to get a little water here. None of that doesn't make any difference. If they kill you, feed you to the lions. They persecute you, whatever. That's not going to separate us from the love of God. We're still going to go to heaven. We're still in God's family. Praise God. We should look at things of this world more lightly than we do sometimes. And what's important is eternal things. Verse 36, and this is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nope. Verse 27 says, nope. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Not just conquerors, super conquerors. That's what that means. It means it's it means a super conqueror, like a super man or a super woman. Hallelujah. You know, in all those things he talked about, you know, we're not just conquerors, we are more than conquerors. Now let me illustrate this. A lot of you have heard me use this illustration, but it bears repeating right now. Let me illustrate this in a simple, simple way. You know, um, let's say that, that there's two professional fighters that are going to have a bout, and one of them's going to get a million dollars or $3 million. The loser gets $3 million, okay, for the fight, but the, the winner gets $40 million. <clears throat> Just illustrating something. Excuse me. So on one hand, you're going to get $3 million, which isn't bad, of course. But on the other hand, there's a $40 million prize for the winner. Well, both these guys are trained athletes. And I mean, they go, have you ever um, check into how boxers or professional athletes treat themselves? They, they, they train, and it is brutal. I mean, they skip meals. They have a nutritionist. They eat right. They work out. They sweat. They're lifting weights. They're running. You ever watch Rocky, you know, get in shape? All of it. They do all that because they want that, that money, you know, that big prize. And so the, finally the big day comes, and they get, when that, when that bell rings, they, have, they used to have 15 rounds, now it's 12 rounds, and they go out there for those 12 short rounds, or only three three minute rounds, whatever. They give it everything they got, all of the preparation, everything they've done. They give it all. They lay it all on the table. After that fight, one of those people, arms are raised, and they are victorious. They are a conqueror. They have conquered in that bout. Now listen closely. The guy hands them a check. $40 million. Wow. And that's something. So the guy's excited. So he showers up everything. And, you know, he knows his family's waiting for him out here. And they're going to be so excited and happy. Man, $40 million, a lot of money. And wow, I've done it. And he feels like a conqueror. And he all of a sudden, he, he, he walks outside and he sees his wife and his little children there. And they're so excited. And... She walks up to him, and she takes that check away from him and smiles. She's more than a conqueror. Because now that money is as much hers as it is his. That's what Jesus did for us. That's why we are not just conquerors. He's the one who conquered. We are what? More than conquerors. Hallelujah. Verse 38, for I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Very powerful. 
What a question. What can separate us from the love of God? Wow. Well, I've run out of time, unfortunately. You know, time flies when you're having fun. I hope you enjoyed that, and I did too. I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, Romans chapter 8, the whole thing. was It's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. So if you've enjoyed it, please share it. That's the way these things get along, get around. Please subscribe uh, so that you can get notifications when we do these videos and, and put new stuff on and, and, and share it with your friends. We really appreciate it. And, you know, remember this. Feed your faith. Starve your doubts to death. You're in our prayers. We love you. God bless you. Till next time.